Hi, my name is Chris Kulmer, and welcome to the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. In this podcast, I explore the unique world of music education in the international school context. You will hear amazing stories from music teachers working at international schools all around the world. Learn tips and tricks from a global community of leading music ed experts and be inspired to develop your capacity to be truly international in your approach to music education. Hello, music teachers in International Schools family. I hope you're all doing well and enjoying the episode so far. Please do get in touch via the MTIIS website or through the Facebook group to let me know what you think of the conversations so far. If you know of someone that you think I should interview on this podcast, do let me know. Now, today I'm excited to be speaking with fellow Australian Samuel Wright. Samuel is a music educator currently living in the Netherlands and working at the International School of The Hague. He previously worked in international schools in Austria and and South Korea. Uh, And I like Samuel's LinkedIn profile, which starts with the statement that creativity and imagination are my goals. Um, I think that's a quote from Samuel, but we'll explore that and I, I like it either way. Samuel is a prolific writer, composer, and music tech innovator who loves to keep his students on their toes with interesting tasks using quirky pieces of gear. Samuel has spoken at global conferences, worked on multiple collaborative arts projects, and has recently written a textbook called Music by Concept, published by Hodder. And this book focuses on the middle years program, the MYP music curriculum from the International Baccalaureate. There are lots of things I'd like to dive into, so let's get into it. And I thought in the interest of mutual Aussiness, I better start mm-hmm. with a, hey, Samuel, how are you, mate? And then day. yes. <laughs> I'm good. Yes. I'm good. Should've, should've started with g'day. G'day, uh, mate. Yep. I'm struggling. I need to practice my Aussiness. Yeah, How's things? Yeah, I'm a bit out of practice too. <laughs> yeah, Good. Good. We've got our Netherlands summer happening. So lovely sunshine. It's 10 p.m. at night and I've got a beautiful sunset, still daylight. It's um, it's a different world. So nice. So let's start off with um, a question. I, I guess I like to start off with all my guests. Can you outline your journey to becoming an international school music teacher for us? Sure. Um I mean, I taught in Australia for many years. I taught at MLC at Burwood, um, um, did sort of off training, um, Monte San Angelo and um, down in Barrel. I taught at a school called Oxley College. So um, most of my teaching has happened around New South Wales, Australia and um, loved working at IGS in Sydney. So a lot of my initial training, um, you know, on the job was there in Sydney. Mm. And um, one of my first teaching jobs was, was I was still at university. I did a maternity cover in Hurstville, um, St. George Christian School. And I had like a guitar orchestra and I did music teaching. And I did that in my fourth year of um, university. So I, I loved it. And that, you know, got my foot in the door. And um, I, yeah, shout out to all of the the teachers that sort of gave the, you know, the, the catch- 22 type of thing is how do you get a job if you don't have the experience because when you apply for the job they say you need experience and you go just give me the experience so I can have the job um all of those teachers that took me on um very grateful because I think all of the foundational stuff that I learned here in Australia there in Australia I then took overseas and it was as simple as applying for an international job in South Korea. And my wife's a teacher as well. So our whole family, we packed up, um, sold everything, only had a suitcase each, maybe two suitcases Mm. and left Australia. And that's literally all we took with us. Um, And we started the journey that way. So worked in South Korea for a few years. Um, Most international school contracts work on a two year basis. 
and then they would get renewed or you move on and then we went to vienna which was amazing like i i can't tell you it's a, it's again leaving australia to go to south korea where you get minus 20 degrees in the winter <laughs> um but similar summer heat and then go to a place like vienna where as you'd expect classical music is you know high on the agenda but then you could go and find a crypt where um like a, a church from 900 AD and they perform old medieval music or you go underground to a jazz club where they're still playing stuff it's just a different world so cool. um yeah so we loved going international but was that simple just taking our experience and saying okay what do we want to do and we applied um there's this group called um uh teacher recruitment international and um we applied with them and they kind of hold all these interviews with different schools and that's how it started yeah nice and then the the move to the netherlands how recent was that mm -hmm. uh just before covid so that was about 2019 um uh kind of was it was it was nice it was when you go to a school most music teachers and all teachers will get this you got that first day apprehension and you know you go got the job and what was really nice about this it was kind of like um uh not so much being headhunted but when um they approached me for position it was so unique, so open, so um, refreshing and new that I kind of went, I had to take this. Because the way they said it was, okay, we want the music department curriculum to sort of go in this direction. We want to add technology. We want to be creative. We want to do this, but we don't know how. Can you do this? And for me, um, I mean, for most music teachers, that's a breath of fresh air, right? You kind of go, sure. yes. So I... Uh, that's why uh, we came here to the Netherlands. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, let's sort of stick with the Netherlands for now and just give us a little bit of an idea of what what do you love about living and working in the Netherlands at the moment? Well, I've got two boys. Um, they're now in their early teens. And so they're going to the school I'm at, the International School of The Hague, and they love it. Um, that's one of the big factors for us we we wanted our kids to have an experience um a global experience for education so that was our driving focus as well as work and fulfillment and things as teachers um we love it here because it's great for kids um the weather if, if you can deal with dark for <laughs> three to four months because it is very dark here during the winter months um but we love the change of seasons, um, the the way that the people are so kind. Um, and whereas I speak a bit of German and Netherlandish is still quite hard for me to get my tongue around, my kids are learning it. Most people also speak English. So there's this community you can instantly be a part of. Um, what I love is spending time in Burwood and Strathfield when I was in Australia. I go to the centre of The Hague and it's the same. It's like a melting pot of every culture, all the different types of foods. It's, yeah, yeah. it's really good. It's so nice. And how are you going with bicycle riding? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that part. Yeah, we, <laughs> we don't even, we haven't driven in almost 10 years. Yeah. So um, we take public transport everywhere because that's amazing in the Netherlands. The, the public transport is just in Vienna as well with the trams. Mm. Um, but the the bike riding, we ride to school, we ride back from school, we ride to jiu-jitsu or the gym, we ride back home, we ride to the shops. Like you could just go everywhere. Yeah. Um, I had to buy some new speakers the other day. You can kind of ride to the person's house, test them out, then put them on your bike and ride home. It's like <laughs> so good. It's and a all different the, world. The it little really bike is. lanes everywhere, so it's kind of accessible. Yeah. You don't feel like you're going to get knocked over all the time. No, it's it's mm. like um, the bikes have just as much respect as the cars, probably more so. Mm. Um, and everything is flat. You have you stay on one side for going this way, and yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> a well-oiled system. It's really yeah. Good. 
Cool, cool. All right, let's talk a bit about music. Um, I think sure. all of us have a nice idea of, of the Netherlands and I mean a brief but nice idea of what's going on mm. in your sort of in your world in the Netherlands and your journey to getting there. So that's really nice. Let's uh, let's talk about the curriculum. So we mentioned mm-hmm. uh, I mentioned earlier the middle years program, the MYP. Um, yes. Could you describe your approach to teaching the MYP music curriculum first and then maybe move on to your approach teaching the IBDP part of the IB music yeah, curriculum? Yeah, sure. Mm. Um, just if anyone doesn't know, the middle years program is um, so an Australian curriculum, it'd be year seven to um, year 10 and then 11, 12. We have year 13 here in the Netherlands. So um 12 and 13 for me is the diploma program. That's where things kind of shift from the middle years. Um, it's still inquiry based, but inquiry focused. And it really becomes uh, a moment where in those last two years, kids develop projects to hand in for their final diploma. Yeah. Um, so that's a big step up when they get to those last two years for diploma. The MYP uh, middle years program, it's kind of, I'll use a play school analogy. Go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> For all those who don't know, kids' TV show, um, you look to the round window, triangle window, square window. The MYP is kind of like that. It's a frame. It's a window. And depending upon what type of glass you've got, when you look through it, they provide, the International Baccalaureate provides the framework, the the structure, um, the language, the, the tools. And I look through it and say, okay, how can I interpret that for teaching music? And what better way to do it than globally because that's been my journey so we look at traditional korean music we look at turkish drumming belly dancing um uh electronic music how to be producer but at the same time the music of strome who's um belgian if i get that correct Mm -hmm. and he includes everything from chilean charango to um like hip-hop and dance rhythms so it's like a we get the freedom to melt everything together and sort of deconstruct it. So I guess the biggest thing, the way that I approach the MYP is whatever music we get to look at, we can have the time to deconstruct it by playing it, deconstruct it by composing with it. And of course you're listening the whole time, but you're listening with a a purpose to take bits apart, sort of twist it. What does this look like? Um, put it back in, take in another piece out. And through doing that, we have kids moving from um, year seven through to year 11, and they engage with all types of music, but they need to understand it, work with it. Hope yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That, that I love the play school analogy, like <laughs> looking through the window. Yeah. Um, what window are we going through? What today. window are you going through? Really nice. So then, so you've got your students working through that kind of deconstruction process, seven to 11. Mm-hmm. What happens for you when you get to the IB DP? Well, the MYP, we still like, I'm off trained. So I put a lot of offshore work into that. Um, we have the tune percussion, we do singing, um, all the things you'd expect to see in a music classroom. Um, The difference being notation is something that comes from that deconstruction process. Mm. So if we're doing traditional music, we will learn graphic or traditional methods of notation as opposed to, um, you know, black dots on a page. Mm. But then if we study musicals, obviously we have to, when we deconstruct musicals, learn notation to then write, because we have this project where they rewrite the ending to Little Shop of Horrors or or whatever. So of course they need that language. Mm. Um, so we have all of those elements, um, but they're all sort of squished into this time frame, um, which maximizes the the ability for kids to absorb, you know, um, what a chord progression is, how bass lines work, etc. Mm. So by the time they get to the end of year eleven, um the three we teach about three units per year for each year level so year 11 do um sorry shameless plug it's in my book um (laughs) they do is rock music plagiarized so it's kind of 
the moment where they take their idea of musical concepts or elements like pitch, rhythm, um, uh, dynamics, expressive techniques, all those things, but they apply it to court cases. So could they defend Ed Sheeran when he was sued for his chord progressions? Could <laughs> they defend um, Katy Perry? Could they, should Nicki Minaj have been sued? Yes, for stealing, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Joe Satriani's chord progression in one of her songs. But they have to use the language of music to do it. Otherwise, they fail the, the task, right? Hmm. So it's putting the skills into practice. Then we do film scoring. Um, and then we end up going to the zoo and sampling animals and making beats and things. So using technology. And that's one of our fun trips that we go nice. on. Yeah. So by year 11, they're at that point where they should be able to speak the language, write the language, um, and then be creative with the language. So when they take that step, because that's a big thing in international schools, getting kids to take diploma music, because mm. it, it's a battle against sciences. They have a certain um, package they have to pick. And those last two years are quite intense. So they have to choose their subjects to be awarded the diploma to then apply for colleges. Right. Yeah. So it's a big step. So to have kids prepared is goal one. But then goal two is uh, 12 and 13 for us. Um, what will we be studying, Mr. Wright? Like what mm. music? What are we doing? And so we can then confidently say, well, you know, all those things you've been doing with us, now we step it up, but it's your turn. You have to pick the music. You have to pick um, the pieces to investigate. So we give them all the skills. But then in diploma, it's sort of the um, the onus, the, the project, the decision-making becomes theirs. So they have to take ownership of a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, no. we've still got performances. They have yeah. to do like a recital and recordings. They have to compose pieces, but it's their choice. Mm. Great. Yeah, that that's all making sense. Cool. So let's go to your book a little bit then um, and explore that a, a little further. So it's called Music by <laughs> Concept. You're going to grab it. Where is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Hotter Education. Tell us a bit more about the book. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you've already given us a couple of ideas of... Uh, potential activities that you've mm -hmm. done with the book, but let's explore the book a little more and how could an international school music teacher use it? Well, um, good question. Mm. It wasn't actually meant to be just for international teachers because having been a part of many curriculums around the world and experiencing them, um, I kind of thought this is like a music cookbook. You open you choose the recipe you want, and then you take the ingredients to make the, the wonderful dish that is your task or the thing you want to teach. So it's like uh, almost 20 years of teaching has been squished um, and the, the experiences I've had into this sort of one package. <laughs> hmm. um, but I've put obviously the labels of how to assess with the middle years program. And I've just updated it recently because the IB has updated the middle years program with new criteria. So if anyone's interested, it's going to be updated. Um, yeah, the approach was look at it like a recipe. Um, if you wanted to teach computer games, how would you do it? And if you're teaching a national curriculum somewhere in the UK or Australia um, or Germany, you could still take those um, elements put them together to deliver your curriculum. Um, I just did it in the IB framework because mm. most international schools teach the international baccalaureate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So it's really flexible mm. then. So anyone could pick it up yeah. and, and apply it potentially. You could, Great. Yeah, you could shop up wheel the whole thing and just <laughs> yeah. spin the wheel and pick. Um, I did try to do it in a structured way. I don't know if this is anyone's done this because I don't um, teach from the first chapter all the way through. That was never my intention. Um, 
what we do here at the International School of The Hague is we will pick certain chapters for certain years. Um, like in year 11, I think we go from chapter four to um, 10 to eight. And that's the, they're the three units we teach. Mm. So it's not a sequential thing in any regard. It's um, we focus, as I said before, a lot on the concepts, a lot on taking things apart to create with. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So people can, uh, we'll, we'll add to the show notes where they could find that book and links to it and things, right? Yeah. Could Great. just be on Amazon or oh. book depository or anywhere really. Yeah. Easy. Cool. Yeah. Great. Um, let's, let's talk a bit about music tech. I was straight away taken by your zoo trip and sampling zoo animals. <laughs> yeah. um, that sounds awesome. I really like the idea. Uh, yeah, it was really fun. It was, <laughs> it was, it's a really good trip. Yeah. Yeah. And as I was like, we've been interacting over the last year or so, a couple of years on different social media platforms and I've been seeing your work and I, I do notice your music technology things that you post. Often these little photos, like I said in the introduction of some random piece of kind of tech, um, a bit of hardware and, and sort of like a, a brief description of something you're doing mm. with it. Um, let's talk about music technology and... Maybe you can tell us why you feel it might be important for music educators or international school music educators, you can go either way, um, to include music technology into their units of work. Oh, um, it, yeah, I mean, it's been coming for a while. Um, but you could look at far, as far back as the 80s with um, the drum machines and Fairlight synthesizer and all these sorts of things. Um, it's pretty, I mean, I remember doing a presentation in Sydney uh, with the AIS, the Association of Independent Schools. Mm. And we looked at this um, bloke from, there's my Australian, yeah, the bloke from <laughs> Perth <laughs> on YouTube his name, his um, call name, his uh, YouTube name is Pogo, P-O-G-O. And if, if I remember the story correctly, he was a kid in school who wanted to learn how to sample and create remixes and things. But this was, I um, want to say 90s, early 2000s. Um, it's been a while since I've researched this, um, but he made, his teacher didn't know how to help him. Mm. So what this kid did is he went home worked out how to use the software, um, got all these Disney video VHS cassettes and started sampling both the audio and the visual elements and combining them together and made these amazing remixes on YouTube. You've probably heard them uh, bangerang from the movie Hook. Um, he's done an amazing series of these. And again, I could be wrong, but I think from a radio program, I heard him speaking. Disney wanted to either sue him or get him in trouble for doing it. But when they heard how great his music was, I think they offered him a job. Yeah. Um, and this, this this was ages ago. But this was a kid in school um, who wanted to know how to do something, but either the teacher or the school um, couldn't support that. And that struck me, and I kind of went you know, I, I should be doing that. I should be learning how to do that too. Mm. And I had similar things of my own. I was learning um, reason um, and early logic um, because of my music teacher. And he, he had these um, standalone Akai samplers where you put the floppy disk in. And I remember trying to do the same thing. I had these Voltron VHS cassettes. I don't know if you remember Voltron, the cartoon. And I was taking like with the five lines and they come, it's a Deadpool reference, then they combine and make one big lion robot. Okay. I'll have to look that one up. I love that as a show as a kid. And yeah. um, I would take all these sounds from it and I started putting them and layering them. Not as good as Pogo, <laughs> but um, I enjoyed it. It was fun. And that kind of, my music teacher started um, encouraging me to look into this type of thing. And I remember doing, he took me to a, it was an Apple or a Logic Pro workshop or something. And he was presenting and he got me to play guitar. So it was from an early age in school, I was learning these things. And I sort of carried it through into teaching. And I studied at New South Wales um, University 
and they had a great technology program there. And I kind of just went, yeah, I'll take some of that. Mm. And it just sort of built from there. But the more I've observed globally, kids produce music at home. You've got the wonderful story of Billie Eilish and her brother Phineas mm. just writing the albums in the bedroom yeah. on Logic. <laughs> yeah. It's just I, I think that we need to know, maybe not be the best producers in the world because I, I was not on the level of Pogo, but knowing how to do bits and pieces is enough to then give to a student and say, have a go, and you don't know what they're going to create. They may take it and run with it and do things you'll never imagine are possible, but you've given them that opportunity. So that's why I think it's so important. It's kind of um, exploded even more in the last few years. Yeah, for sure. And if someone wanted to get started with this, so say if they, you know, they haven't got any yeah. tech or they haven't really got someone giving them, you know, um, tips on where to start. Where where should they start? What's a maybe like a, a piece of gear or a piece of software or where would you start with getting music tech elements into the, your curriculum? I kind of do work like this for AMI, the um, Association of Music and International Schools, mm. um, but as a music tech consultant, I get asked that question a lot. Mm. Um it depends. This is the this is the thing about music technology. It depends what you want to do or where you want to go, <laughs> um, because you can. I've just written um, like a small album for a student's uh, video slash play, and I did it all on my laptop with my MIDI keyboard. But I had sounds that I put into Logic Pro, which is a DAW, a digital audio workstation. But I made them sound realistic. So there's this whole film scoring aspect. Mm. But if you want to produce beats or if you want to learn how to do synthesis and sort of live DJ music presentations, there's all these fields you can go into. True, true. Um, and with streaming, uh, Hulu, Amazon, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, all of these jobs are starting to appear. Um, sound design is a huge one where you just create sounds <laughs> for films. Mm. Um, computer game writing, of course. Um, but there's this job also called a music supervisor. So, for example, um, let's say you work for Netflix and The Queen's Gambit is this TV series that's coming up. And it's your job to say, all right, it's set in this time period. It needs this type of music and this will fit with the, the aesthetic. I'll contact people and do copyright. That's an actual job. And you get paid to recommend music. <laughs> but it involves so much in the background. And I think that is what paralyzes a lot of kids when they sort of see stuff on YouTube or interviews but us teachers as well. I can't, you kind of go, there's too much. I don't know where to begin. Yeah. So I think three things, get a door, um, digital audio workstation, and just start writing music that you want to write. So it could be GarageBand on the iPad. It could be Reason, um, which is actually reasonably priced. Sorry. <laughs> Very good. good um, fun. I like that. Ableton. Yeah. Yeah. Ableton is really good for music production and you can just get on YouTube and start learning stuff. It is that simple. So get a DAW. Um, the second thing I'd probably say is get some sort of device where you can at least start to sample or start to make beats um, where you can learn to perform at least something rhythmic live. Um, there's so much out there, but... I've got these little things that I, I carry around. So you could have something like this. And what it allows you to do is attach any sound to any one of these pads that you can then record in or trigger and perform. And, and just you plug to, it into a PDA. Or just to jump in there, for those who might be listening and not watching yeah. this, Sam's holding up a, I don't know how big it is, maybe 30 centimeter tall machine it looks yeah. like a giant calculator basically with lots of pads on it um and at the back lots of plugs that you can plug into <laughs> um yeah, and yeah. yeah continue 
it's basically uh, a drum machine. Mm. Um, however, what it does is combine all the drums and all the sounds and all the things you probably would have heard in every soundtrack ever, but you get to perform each element yourself. So you can just tap the pads in time. Um, I've done things in school where we have our percussion ensemble, but we plug this and other things into the PA. Yeah, nice. So the percussion kids use you marimba vibraphone but then we're also playing beats um so i it also samples so what you do is you record bird noises knives and forks clattering um to create different patterns mm. um so you know you get your d-o-w d-a-w to start producing music you get a device like this where you can start to perform things live play drum patterns sample um and if you're interested in synthesis you don't really need to go out and buy the, you know, uh, Art Odyssey or some sort of Moog huge <laughs> thousand yeah. dollar thing. Um, there's a company called Arturia and they have this little device. These are the types of things that you're talking about. Like, yeah. You know, in my post. and I take this to school and they're touch sensitive, the keys. But the part that you'd be interested in are all of these knobs and dials and things mm. because they cover all the basics of synthesis and how to make your own sounds. And it sounds amazing. So and good. I think the cost is like 200 euros or something. Like compared to really expensive equipment, you can just rock up, plug it in, experiment, record pass it to the next student they do the same thing record and that gives you the chance to physically get your hands on something if you don't want to just be sitting at a computer mm. so i guess three steps would be one decide if you want to produce right music at your laptop number two if you like to perform things live get something like a, a beat making machine um this one is relatively new from roland it's called the SP404. I love it because it's fun. And you can do it in the classroom without any computer or any setup. And the other one is, if you want to get into synthesis, it's called the Micro Freak. And you can literally just start straight away working with different sound waves. And they all sound good for the entry price level. And I think from there the kids will start to notice. They'll start to go, how did you do that? And my little trick is I sort of go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I did this. And I step back and you kind of watch them. I never subscribe to the term digital native because um, I've seen many teachers much older than I using technology brilliantly. So I, I feel it's more of a mindset. Hmm. So those kids that have that mindset for technology and exploring and being, we call it risk taking in the IV, um, they'll do it and they'll just explore and make crazy stuff and they'll love it. Hmm. And that's kind of how I see my role. I go, okay, I'll explore this thing. I'll do what I can with that. And then I'll pass it on to the student who I think is going to benefit from it. And that's kind of how I've, step by step learned these little things sorry that was a long answer but oh i think it's fantastic so again you kind of summarized it but the three kind of main things just in case we missed it was the daw the digital audio workstation computer-based software yeah. for for producing music just start the, making yeah yeah the beat making device of some kind and the third thing um you held up for us which if you again if you're listening yeah. was basically a mini keyboard of sorts like a two octave keyboard right um yeah uh and they're so flexible and portable so they're three great little little pieces of technology and they power by usb so you can just get a usb power bank you don't even need to have those chunky power uh cables that you carry around you just plug it into your laptop and it works or mm. plug it into a power bank and it works yeah and that's kind of you know, if you travel a lot or if you're on public transport a lot. Um, or riding a bicycle. Just, yeah. Or riding a bicycle. Just <laughs> whack it in the saddlebag on the side and, yeah. Nice one. 
Okay, brilliant. So I think some fantastic suggestions there for teachers, practical, um, but also I can see straight away how just dabbling with those three elements for sure would um, be something, yeah, quick and easy and probably quite applicable. And like you said, if you just bring one of those especially the two hardware devices, the, the beat making device and the, yeah. the MIDI keyboard. It's the like, tactile element. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's straight away it's there. Okay, so what I norm- go on. Sorry, man. What I normally do, I'm just thinking of teachers going, because we have quite small classes. Mm. So I can, I can just sort of hear myself going, oh, what if there was a large class? I get a little sneaky and I get a guitar pedal. And if you get two or three, and you sort of connect them up to one of those devices, you can have almost four or five kids up tweaking things and experimenting with sounds. Um, guitar pedals are great for that because you can literally just pick something up and everything is tactile and they're not going to break anything. So that they just plug the sound in, plug the sound, daisy chain it, and that experimenting with sound is also part of the the journey of music tech. You're not just learning the thing, you're experimenting with the sounds that are available because of the device, right? Right. So I get you. So you could have five, six, depends on how many pedals you've got. You daisy chain them all up yeah. and everyone's yep. just tweaking things and changing the sound. Someone's got a guitar maybe at the, the front end of the chain or a, or a keyboard or whatever you yeah. started the, the sound source with. And then everyone's having mm-hmm. a go and tweaking. And then my little trick secret is I have it plugged in at the end to my computer recording everything. Yeah. So nice. at the end, they actually have um, whatever it is they did. You may not use all of it because <laughs> it's probably like, <laughs> um, but there are some golden moments. You go, oh, yeah, that's really cool. And we'll use that. And then we can chop it and then use our other skills later to turn it into beats or a layer or an instrument and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. It's all about getting your hands on it yeah. because there's something lost when you just sit at the computer. Um, and that's as a guitarist myself using guitar pedals, you know, you get to find settings and hear the sound as you turn the knobs and kids love that too. So the more it becomes a group activity of creating sound, then we can start to go, hey, what if we actually put a beat to this? Or what if we actually made this into a pseudo film score or soundscape? And then the project sort of evolves from there. Yeah. Fantastic. It's, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. Sounds fun. Cool. Okay. Well, I was going to sort of segue, but I love that we went back into the the pedal daisy chain thing. <laughs> that was great. Um, we talked about your book and mm-hmm. as I was looking around and, and as we chatted a bit before, um, we started recording, you've worked on so much books, collaborative projects, professional development. Um, firstly, how do you, as a, a music teacher in an international school, which is typically quite busy and intense, how do you manage to fit in all the extra stuff? And then maybe what is your driving kind of passion for being involved in all of these areas outside of your work as a school teacher? Yes, my um, my wife says the same thing, asks the same <laughs> thing. Um, even on holidays now, I'm online looking at YouTube videos on how to compose custom projects for people to sort of have a, I have like a, a side, um, many side hustles, but it's kind of what you're saying. I love being creative and learning new things. So at the moment, I'm looking to compose music for people, uh, sort of like custom composition projects and um, writing for like sound libraries and stuff. Um, it's, It's the teaching part. I think we're very lucky as music teachers. We pick a career that we are energized by. We pick a career that we love to investigate and learn more about. So every day, every week, every year, is, it's it's something new. And we get tired. You know, we get cranky. We, I come home and I put noise-canceling headphones on because I don't want to hear anything. Yeah. Um, but it's. I think we're quite fortunate in that we have a career that is uplifting and we get to perform and we get to learn new things all the time. 
Um, but for me, I like to, I need in myself to be able to learn more and push further because I don't, like once I learn something and master it, I kind of go, hmm, okay, so what would happen if, and it's that question that always drives me, okay, so if I wrote that, what would happen if I turned it into synthwave? Because, you know, I love Stranger Things on Netflix. I thought, could I write music like that? And that then becomes a challenge. So I think for me, it's, I like challenging myself to learn about and do the things I see. Um, we are professionals, but uh, musicians in film or TV and media doing. So I call them up. I I call up people in advertising. I call up people, um, a friend of mine, John Hunter, he wrote advertisements and uh, taught it years ago in Australia, the fantastic flying books of Morris Lesmore. Hmm. Huge long title. Wrote the score for that, and I think he won a BAFTA for it. So I, I call these people up and I go, how do you do that? Can you teach me? Um, so a lot of the drive is... I just want to know more and I want to learn more. Um, but another part of that is I'm not that young anymore. And I kind of look around and I go, man, I could go to Egypt and learn how their music works. Or I could go to Turkey and learn about their music. Will I get the chance? So I kind of, you know, with COVID, we're stuck at home, right? Mm. And it oh, doesn't come back. I hope not. Um, all of these avenues for extra learning have presented themselves and I kind of want to grab those. So the book was a, a way of solidifying the past 17, 18 years of teaching. That was kind of my way of going, right, I can put that aside and share it because that, that's what my website was. I was sharing things, but then <laughs> teaching family life kind of gotten in the way and I stopped blogging and I kind of went, Oh, I've got to do something about that. Mm -hmm. So that's why the book to share all the lesson plans. Um, but now I'm looking into a lot of composing and digital media because the world's going that way with streaming and, um, computer games and, um, mobile games and even just YouTube ads. Um, having the ability to teach kids how to do that as well, for the industry that they're going to be a part of um, is a, a driving factor for me. Great. And you mentioned, um, you know, your wife asking you the same question that I ask you, <laughs> how, how do you fit it in? I guess that's an, I'm not sure if you answered that. Maybe you did, but if you didn't, yeah. yeah. Strategies, how do you fit this stuff in? Um, I like staying up late at night and, writing music mm. um i used to have an xbox and i remember years ago in australia playing it and then looking at my watch and going oh heck it's 6 a.m i've got work in an hour <laughs> <laughs> and so i got rid of that real quick um and we don't have a tv um so we read lots um we have like apple tv and um laptops and if we want to watch something you know we sit down and watch it so i use a lot of my time to um, create, learn to play, practice, and a bit of an introvert, extrovert, I kind of get my energy from doing that and then teaching in the classroom and then coming back and learning. So that's kind of who I am as a person. And my wife, she just laughs because she knows that and she goes, okay, just let him do that. Yeah. <laughs> and he'll be happy. Um, so yeah, I just spend a lot of time late at night um i might go to bed at one or two um not all the time but i love creating that way and now i get to share with my boys because they're getting into um uh, their teens and we didn't push instruments on them but the youngest wanted to play violin and the eldest plays piano and he's chosen music and he's really interested in this sonology this uh manipulation of sound so you know i gave him my arturia uh, keyboard and um, logic and he's experimenting and sort of testing things stuff I never got to do as a kid 
So it's, I don't know, it's kind of, I guess that's what I'm prioritizing for myself mm. at the moment. And yeah. I just make the time as much as possible. Yeah. Sounds like just part of life. Your lifestyle almost integrates um, this kind uh, of learning it, in. It, like two set violin on YouTube, 40 hours of practice. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well. It's, it's, it's like anything. It's, it's a practice. If you practice piano, singing, guitar, it, it's a similar thing. It's a, a, I like to practice composition. I like to practice making sounds. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, great. Before we, uh, before the chat, before we started recording again, we spoke about the way that um, you feel or you, yeah, you were sort of articulating the way that music teachers should be sort of looking for what to do next, maybe in terms of developing their skills um, mm. and their approach to being a music educator. I think you mentioned before as well that you're kind of always on a hustle or you have lots of hustles and um, and also yeah. you mentioned something like you're keen on having an edge. Could you maybe sort of elaborate on this a little with me? Again, this is this is something that is definitely what my wife acknowledges in me that I, I, I have this drive, I have this, I want to learn more. Um, so, it may not translate the same way for everybody, but music teachers, we are both blessed that we have a career that is creative and open, but things change so much. Um, you've got the streaming industry, you've got um, um, film, you've got um, the way that careers and the way that educators are viewed let's be honest, can be negative. Um, all, all of this comes into play and then you look at yourself as a professional, as an educator, and you go, okay, what fulfills me? Um, what is it that is feeding me? Um, I love being in the classroom. That is something I never want to leave because that's where I get my energy and I, I love teaching different students and the best part is when those year 13s graduate, we all go out to dinner and we sort of reminisce over our two years, um, the laughter and the tears, and then they go off into the world, but they have those connections with you. But then for myself, that hustle idea, that um, the idea of bettering or having an edge, it's I think it's something that we can be unique about. So, for example, um, what if writing books and sharing lessons online was something that somebody could do and make a name for themselves. And in, in the international community, that also serves as a great resume builder, a great sort of um, door opener and things that can lead to pathways we don't even mm. know will happen. If you're a great beat maker, maybe one day that is something you can build and it becomes a focus um, of how you can teach students and get you a job further down the line. I think it's a mindset that if you can build an edge, something you're um, known for, something that you can share, something that you're a part of, that then becomes, it sounds a little harsh, something you can market, something that you can promote. But that in turn helps you in your career and helps your students so it's kind of like this, uh, I was just playing a game with my son. It's kind of like a Japanese game. It's kind of like that idea of balance and you've got the classroom, but then you've got the thing that enriches and builds you up as a musician. Mm. They work together, but it's um, finding it. It's finding it. That's the key. And it's taken me a long time and I'm really loving this composition element uh, with, you know, technology and scoring and stuff um so i think the lessons in the book was an idea of me testing things out going where's this gonna go what can i do with this um the blog was kind of like i'm sharing ideas let's see what this does let's see where this takes me um and i'm always testing and sort of seeing what is it i can put my hand to and over the years that's led me on this path from, you know, South Korea to Vienna to the Netherlands. 
but I would never have guessed that <laughs> um, back in um, MLC Burwood, Australia. So it's kind of, it's good being able to look back. It's hard looking forward. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's... Does that, does that answer your question? It totally does. And I think maybe we can sort of tie this part of the conversation up and sort of... Um, summarize it maybe with this question mm-hmm. what would be your number one piece of advice for well let's kind of yeah back to the start almost but tying mm-hmm. everything in what would be your number one piece of advice for anyone that would be interested in teaching music in an international school um i would say straight away become adept um proficient powerful even at some form of music technology really um even something like a note piece of, of notation software like the new dorico that's come out um from steinberg um be proficient at some level of music technology because it is something that is going to be part of the new it is part of the new uh diploma curriculum and myp as well and if you're teaching internationally that's that's a must have um I would also say feed your musician, your personal musician, kind of like the two set violin idea of 40 hours of practice. Um, find something that you can do with your instrument that enriches, um, gives you a life outside of the classroom. And even new teachers coming up, become proficient at curriculum writing, like writing, not lesson plans. What I mean is um, connected creative projects. So that way, when you're applying for work, you can show and speak, um, speak, how shall we say, in a way that steps someone who's listening to you through the types of ideas that you would lead students down. Mm. So if you imagine a garden path and you're involving some sort of technology and some sort of performance project at the end, become proficient at mapping how you would teach your curriculum. And the more you do that, share it, put it Mm. online, blog it, um, make documentation of what you do because the more you can show, it's that whole musician, like if a tree falls in the forest, did it really happen? It's like yeah. if a concert, <laughs> if no one was at the concert, did the concert happen? <laughs> um, and in international schools, we say if the concert wasn't uh, videoed, did it really happen? Um, it's kind of, yeah, I would say become adept, proficient, masterful at some form of technology um, find a way to use your instrument, your skill, whether it's guitar, singing, whatever, um, outside of the classroom in a band or online or on YouTube, something. Um, and the third thing is become adept or proficient at mapping sort of that garden path where you show each of the activities. Because if you're new to the profession, that's a great thing to talk about in interviews. That, I mean... If I was interviewing someone and they could say, oh, yeah, we do this and go this and it's creative and engaging, that's exactly what people want to hear. Absolutely. Um, and if you proficient teachers, teachers have been doing it for years, put that stuff out online, I can just say the amount of teachers who've um, messaged me, DM'd me or asked for things and I just go, yeah, here you go. Um, I don't need to be paid for it because I have a job. The gratitude and the thanks. I've had messages back from kids um, saying, thank you for sharing this. Um, I really love this activity. I don't know if many other professions get that. Yeah, I think that is quite an amazingly unique, well, I think, <laughs> thing to music education, mm-hmm. this willingness to share. And um, and I think that's what I love about the international school music teaching community is, is that, uh, that willingness to share. So, what about so mm. yeah if someone was more you know interested in one of the things you've spoken about today or wants to learn something maybe that's part of your book or wants to get some more ideas specifically from mm-hmm. Samuel Wright how would they contact you what's the best way to get in touch with you 
uh, you can contact me through my website, brightstuffmusic.com. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I'm on Instagram or LinkedIn. LinkedIn's a really good way because um, then we can see where we are in the world. And um, it's all about teaching and sharing, which is a really good system. Yeah. Um, but go to my website, send me an email. Um, I'll be updating it further in the next couple of weeks. And um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I've done lessons sort of like team teaching things with schools in India and Norway and stuff like that, opposite yeah. <laughs> parts of the globe. And it's just fun because we can, um, as I said, we can share and learn from each other. And I think that kind of builds up the, there was a author, Pasi Salberg from Finland. The, um, if I get the book title correct, um, called Staff Capital. It's this idea that in a school, if teachers are valued, appreciated, and respected, they stay. And the more that they do that for teachers, the top down, people stay. And staff capital, the thinking, the knowledge, the experience, it builds. Um, if we do that as music teachers, then that's all that's going to happen. All our skill and experience is going to rise. And that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Is there anything else, Samuel, that you wanted to share with us? Maybe we didn't cover something. Anything else you want to you want to tell us today? Put me on the spot. <laughs> um, no, I think I want to thank you for including me on this podcast. This was really nice. Thank you. Um, I guess if people are interested in becoming international school teachers. It is a wonderful career. Um, The IB curriculum is both creative and open and gives you a freedom to explore avenues you may not have thought of before. Um, You can contact recruitment agencies and there's schools all over the world. You can go to Abu Dhabi, you can go to Thailand, you can um, experience the actual world (laughs) um, in different classrooms. And that comes with, the, you know, when you finish school, you have to go and order food or you have to go to the supermarket. So I had to learn some Korean to actually get around. Um, So there's lots of things that being an international school teacher does for you and your family because you can also bring your family. Um, So I highly recommend it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Samuel. And all the best with your your projects. I'm sure people will be jumping online and wanting to see how this latest composition project is uh, it goes and is going and um, checking out your book and any other publications you have. So all the best with all of that and uh, continue enjoying your time in the Netherlands um, and have a great rest of your summer on your holidays. Ooh. I just remembered one more thing. Put Go my on. hand up. Yep. <laughs> one of the best things is you get friends in almost every continent on earth. And I I think that's amazing. So I can yeah. call up my friend in Vienna and talk to her about all sorts of music nerdy stuff <laughs> in German. And then you can call up your friend in Norway and talk about primary music. Edu- it's, I, it's so hard to describe. Like yeah. even our connection. Yeah. Yes, we've got the Australian connection, but that, that international music understanding, there's something about that where you can just call up a friend on the other side of the world and go, how about this? What do you think? Yeah. I love that. Love that too, that true international kind of community. Mm. Fantastic. Samuel, thanks again. We're going to leave it there and I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Thank you, man. Thanks. Thanks, mate. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. Listen to other episodes by visiting mtiis.com or learn more about our community on Facebook by simply searching for Music Teachers in International Schools. If you know someone who you think I should get on the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me at chriskulma.com, C-H-R-I-S-K-O-E-L-M-A. See you next time.